Hello, everyone, and welcome to our series. And I just want to officially welcome everyone. I see there's a little bit of informal chat and folks are getting settled in. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Budin, and I will be serving as your series facilitator. I look forward to getting to know all of you and working with all of you over the course of the next five weeks. I have a few things that I want to share, a few housekeeping items before we officially get started with our journey. So here we are for our selecting and adapting materials for online language learning and teaching. This is our 2019 online language pedagogy webinar series. This series is brought to us by the National Foreign Language Resource Center with the University of Hawaii at Manoa and made possible through a grant from the US Department of Education. This series is designed for the in-service online language teachers. The webinar is going to focus on selecting and adapting materials for online language learning and teaching. Our webinar dates and times are listed here. If you didn't have a chance to watch the video that I created yet, and that was sent out in an email blast, I wanna say about a day ago, please take the time to go through and watch the video. It explains a few things related to logistics. Our series will cover five dates and the times are listed here. On November 5th, the United States, at least the mainland, will switch back to our standard time from daylight savings time. However, the mainland US times will stay the same and Hawaii time will shift from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So please mark your calendars accordingly as we wouldn't wanna miss you. Our webinar platform and call-in numbers are all listed out here. The webinar link that you use to attend is going to stay the same through the series of our webinars, so please use the same link each week. And when you enter the webinar, please go ahead and register with your full name as well as the email address in order to be counted for your attendance. You want to use the one that you use to register for the webinar series with. Our call-in numbers are listed here. The phone numbers uh, that are listed are more designed for our folks in the US and Canada. Our folks joining us from abroad can use international numbers and those are available at the zoom.us link that's posted there. And you can also download the free Zoom app for smartphones and or tablets if you need to catch us on the go at zoom.us slash support slash download. And again, when you enter the Zoom room, just be sure to use the email and the name you registered with so we can count you for attendance. From logistics point, if you have a question or if you want to ask something to our presenters, you'll want to go to the chat session. So that's over more in the uh, right hand corner and down toward the lower right hand corner, you'll want to put down that you want to send the chat to all panelists and attendees so we can make sure that we catch your questions. The series website is located here and just to quickly go through and show everybody we've got a lot of information on our series website and I'm going to go ahead and just post this in the chat after I've done uh, my presenting but I do want to make sure that everybody knows that you can go to our series website and get some important information about our series right here and uh, almost through the logistic stuff. If you are interested in earning a badge, you'll be eligible to earn the materials SNA badge, provided that you have shown that you've learned about the material selection and adaptation in online language learning, that you've attended at least four of our five live webinars, attended and actively participated in our discussions and our activities during the live webinars, We'll also need to make sure that you're posting your responses to our discussion prompts in the TED Ed lessons. You'll receive links to those about a day or two after our webinars and completed a 3 to one reflection for each webinar session. The 3 to one reflection piece is included in the video that we created. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that, please watch the video to learn more about how to create a 3 to one reflection. Participants who earn the digital badge might also be eligible to earn a CEU credit. If you are coming to us through the North Carolina Virtual Public School, you'll automatically be considered for CEU credit. But participants from other schools and institutions who wish to earn the CEU credit need to send an email to sfleming at hawaii.edu and provide the name, title, and contact info, phone and or email for the supervisor who will be responsible for approving and awarding your credit. 
And my name is Sarah Booten. Again, I will be serving as your series facilitator. I am a Japanese language instructor at North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. I have the honor of serving as our series facilitator for our 2017 series, and I'm very happy to be back with everyone. Please reach out to me if you have questions or need help. My email is posted there. You can also catch me on Twitter at Booten Sensei, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or need anything. So we'll go ahead and jump into our series with our first session on working on open educational resources. And as educators, we're always looking for new educational resources and materials to share with our students. And today joining us, we have Billy Meinke Lau from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So Billy is the open educational resources technologist and he works for the University of Hawaii at Manoa Outreach College. Billy previously worked for Creative Commons, which is the nonprofit which created the open licenses used on the majority of our OER resources. He's currently a PhD student in the Future Studies program at University of Hawaii at Manoa, and he's focusing on the politics of collaboration on personal data privacy and protection in educational settings. Billy's also a California native, and he's been in Hawaii for almost 10 years. So Billy, I do want to welcome you to our panel. We're very excited to have you with us this afternoon, evening, and uh, morning, depending on where you are in the world. Aloha, um, my name is Billy Mikey Lau, um, and I work for the UH Manoa Outreach College. Um, and it's wonderful to be here with you today. It's wonderful to see so many participants from all over the world. Um, it's actually a pretty rare opportunity to speak with folks from so many different countries and regions of the world. Um, and I imagine there's a wide variety of languages that, that many of you are focusing on. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit more information, I am the OER technologist for the UH Manoa Outreach College, and I focus on um, OER adoption and OER creation. Um, so we do have a small publishing operation happening um, where I work with faculty um, here at UH Manoa, and I offer a, a small grant program to um, offset faculty time when they are ready to take an existing OER resource and adapt it for their teaching or um, when they are ready to, uh, to publish something new and original. So I've been doing OER training for a number of years now. Um, as Sarah said, I used to work for a Creative Commons, the nonprofit that put out the free licenses um, that sort of make open, that make open educational resources open. Um, and so um, I've brought the training I've done for a number of years to the, to the UH system, and I am happy to share it with you today. Um, I'm gonna begin a screen share just a moment. And I'm hoping um, that everybody can have the link to um, this UH OER training guide. This is a UH OER training guide, but it's not necessarily focused just on folks in Hawaii. Many of the lessons and the information inside is applicable to, to folks uh, everywhere. Um, and this is sort of um, my years of experience distilled down into um, bite-sized chunks, if you will, um, to sort of uh, make it very easy and clear what OER are, um, how to apply open licenses, how copyright and the public domain work, um, and where to begin when you're looking for OER that you can use in your own teaching and instruction. So if, if everybody could open this up, I'm going to do the screen share and kind of walk everybody through it. Um, there are, there's more information in this book than we'll be able to cover in this session. Um, but people happen to love things in groups of threes. And so this book has broken down an intro to OER into three sections. We'll be covering the first one today, uh, which is really just OER 101. What is it? Why would you be doing it? How the licenses apply and where to begin looking for OER. Um, but there are supplementary sections that I cover in additional workshops here at UH. Um, one that focuses um, more specifically on copyright and OER um, I am not a lawyer, I am not a copyright lawyer, but I do understand copyright law um, fairly well. Um, and so again, I've sort of, sort of written these, um, this information in a way that should be applicable and useful to many folks. Um, and then lastly, um, again, my role at UH is to encourage um, adoption of resources and creation of resources and how content and curriculum are written and created really affects how useful they are when they're shared. Um, a lot of times folks, uh, you know, you curate your own notes and you write your own material as you go and use it in your instruction. 
and that is great. And sort of a next step to that is uh, refining the form and the structure and the accessibility for individuals who might have disabilities that may be using screen readers and so on. Um, so that when you publish and share things, um, it, it works very well everywhere and it's easy to use. So uh, without further ado, we are going to jump in and I'm going to navigate to the first section, uh, which is defining open educational resources. Um, and um, at a couple different points over the next 40 minutes or so, um, I will stop and uh, our awesome facilitators will be monitoring the chat. Um, and if you have a question related to something uh, fundamental, something uh, tied into what we cover, um, please raise it in the chat and, and we'll find time to answer those questions. Um, otherwise, you can wait till the end and we'll have uh, 10 or 15 minutes where everybody can, can ask questions and we can have a, a small discussion before um, everyone uh, departs for the, the morning or evening or whatever time it may be where you are. So uh, let's begin. So the learning objective um, for this first section is uh, to be able to define OER. So what are OER? OER are uh, learning, teaching, and research resources that are both free of cost and come with reuse rights. Um, when we talk about reuse rights, that's specific to copyright. Um, in the United States and in a lot of jurisdictions all over the world, um, copyright is automatic. Um, and often there isn't, uh, you do not need to register your creative work uh, for it to be copyrighted. Um, but as in uh, where things are in the United States, um, all rights to the work are reserved for the original creator. And so this is a good thing in terms of preserving rights for the person who created the work, but also when it comes to sharing resources, um, copyright can actually hinder collaboration, which is why uh, we, we point to um, open, uh, open licenses as a way to legally share um, this work. So um, with these rights or permissions, we're able to adapt OER content for various contexts without worrying that we're running afoul of copyright law. Um, the, the way things work with automatic copyright is that when you create something and you put it online, um, Others can, can view it for free, but anything beyond viewing it um, often needs to have the permission of the creator. So you need to reach out to that person and ask them. But when you apply a Creative Commons license or an open license to the work, it makes it very clear why folk, or how folks can use the work without them having to ask every time. And that's sort of uh, the bridge, how we got to have lots of open educational resources published in repositories all over the world um, and really sort of opening up how we can share curriculum. Um, I do want to point to uh, the, it's called the Hewlett Definition. Um, the Hewlett Foundation is a philanthropic organization um, and they were originally, uh, to the Hewlett Foundation, you may recognize the name from Hewlett Packard, the computer company um, that, was, uh, that was doing quite a bit of business um, back in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, they now have, have a philanthropic arm um, which was actually very important in funding the original projects, which sort of spawned the OER movement and how they define open educational resources is uh, that they are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license, like a copyright license, that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So OER can be anything um, from full courses to individual lesson plans, to modules, um, textbooks, um, other kinds of media as well, include, including uh, videos, tests, softwares, uh, software and other tools. Um, just about anything you might use uh, content-wise in your courses and in your instruction might be considered an OER if it has an open license on it. And so if you're following along in the book, you'll notice a couple links out uh, to the Hewlett Foundation website, which is a good resource to find sort of looking at the projects that the Hewlett Foundation has funded and sort of where OER began with their initial funding of, of open initiatives. And also to the Wikipedia page um, for open educational resources. Uh, and Wikipedia is, is oftentimes uh, the first port of call when individuals are looking to find out, you know, what is, what is a thing and so when you want to find out what OER are, the Wikipedia page is a good place to start. Um, and as we're scrolling down, if you have the, the 
uh, handbook open in your browser, you can see uh, there's a little knowledge check, and this will be a part of the TED Ed lesson later on um, that you can complete as part of the series, as Sarah said, to earn a badge um, as far, part of this process. So uh, what are the following describes an OER? And I'll kind of do this live with you. Uh, there are four options. Um, being free to view online, that may not be an OER because it might be missing something. Uh, being sourced from a reputable publisher, uh, that may not be the criteria we're looking for. Uh, being available in a high resolution format, that might not determine if it's an OER. But lastly, being free of cost and having an open license. Let's uh, click this option, we'll click check. And I have a gold star and I got that one right. So remember that there are two parts um, to the definition of OER. One is that it's free of cost, so monetary, there's no cost involved. And two, that there's also an open license on it. You may find lots of content um, on online platforms like YouTube um, and lots of places. Um, and if it's free to view, that's really nice. Um, but if there is not an open license on it, um, you may be restricted in ways you can use it. So I'm going to move on to the next part. So why OER? And obviously, um, there, there are a couple reasons that sort of stand out, um, but we're going to sort of dive a little deeper into the common motivations for OER adoption and use. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I've been in my position here at the University of Hawaii encouraging OER adoption and now publishing um, primarily um, to offset cost to students. And just sort of as a, an anecdote, um, we did a survey of our undergraduate students, our, our um, you know, first through fourth year bachelor's degree students. Um, and we found that many of them delay buying a textbook until they absolutely need it. They skip buying a textbook, even though they know that it will affect their performance in course. Um, and they, they also try to share a textbook and they try all these various ways to get around paying a cost. Um, because for these students, um, uh, you know, cost of a textbook at, at 100, 200, or even $300 per course can be the difference between them succeeding um, and them sort of struggling even further. So scroll down. Um, so um, the, the two primary motivations for the UH, the University of Hawaii OER initiative are one, to save students money on course materials. And two, the second piece, and a really important piece is to facilitate academic innovation. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of unpack them down here below. So the cost savings piece, um, there have been a number of estimates that sort of changed over time in terms of how much money um, students, uh, specifically in the U.S., spend on textbooks, um, and uh, you may have seen some graphs sort of charting the rise of the cost of textbooks, um, and this rise in costs um, from 2006 actually outpaced uh, the rise in inflation. So when you look at um, inflation and the cost of textbooks and other sort of typical costs that a household might go to, textbooks have really gone up in cost. Um, and uh, sort of something that's happened more recently is that the major textbook publishers, the Macmillan and uh, Pearson and Cengage and those folks, um, they have actually shifted to textbook rentals, which is sort of an apples versus oranges sort of thing um, to sort of offset the, the costs. Um, but they still are reluctant to use OER or to put an open license on the materials. Um, we know also, as I mentioned before, that the cost of textbooks uh, forces students to make poor academic decisions. Um, if, if many of you have been involved in teaching and instruction for any significant amount of time, you probably have had students who either um, didn't buy the textbook or just you know, sort of avoided it until it's absolutely necessary. We want to eliminate those reasons um, why students might not succeed in instruction and sort of get that out of the way and give them the resources they need um, to, to get the job done. Um, the other piece that's really interesting um, beyond cost savings is the academic innovation piece. And having worked firsthand with faculty here at the University of Hawaii, um, I've seen sort of what's possible. Um, we've done a lot of sort of building proofs of concept in terms of um, instructors gathering up their existing notes and reusing other existing um, open content to create something new 
And all of that was only made possible because the content was free of cost and had the open license that allowed us these, it gave us these permissions to engage with the content more deeply. Um, and some examples of how folks, how instructors might do this, um, they can localize the content with uh, local or regional examples. Um, an example of this is we have a human nutrition textbook um, that supports an undergraduate course here at UH Manoa. Um, and so the existing textbook, it was okay, but it was still close to $140. And the instructor was doing a lot of work trying to allow students to use previous versions and match up page numbers. And it was really just a lot of work that had nothing to do with learning about nutrition. And so what we did was we gathered uh, a handful um, of existing textbooks and grabbed chapters from each of them and compiled them into one larger textbook and went through a process of review and editing them for, for tone and quality and content all the way through, and then added in local examples of food you might find here in Hawaii. Um, obviously here in Hawaii, we're pretty far away from the closest uh, continent, the largest man mass. And so the foods available to us may not be the same as the foods available um, on the continent or in other parts of the world. And so we're able to localize the learning materials because we had permissions to do so. It's a really important piece. Um, often, a lot of times, uh, the instructors, they don't actually want to make sort of line edits individually in the content, but the way they teach a certain topic may require them to reorder the content. And that's something that's actually straightforward and pretty, pretty simple to do, um, but you're only allowed permissions to do that if it's OER. Um, another piece to it, and if you follow the, the TED Ed lesson later on, you'll, you'll see um, one of the question prompts asks sort of what you might do, what might be possible once the content is open. And one of those pieces, it's, it's referred to as either open pedagogy or open enabled pedagogy, which really involves having the students either contribute to the book through upkeep and maintenance, or actually add student examples and their own work to the book or to the content or to the course, which is sort of something that's not really possible, again, when you're unable to adapt the content. So uh, those are a couple of reasons uh, why we're doing this at UH. Again, one is to address um, economic concerns and, and the fact that many students sort of avoid buying uh, the curriculum of the textbook because of costs. And the second piece is to facilitate this academic innovation. And this is the really interesting part um, that really makes my job fun and rewarding. So we'll scroll down uh, to the knowledge check. And the question is, which two of the below are common motivators for OER use in education? Um, so again, there, there are more, uh, more uses for this or more sort of motivators, but the two we're going to point out here, let's look at the first one, uh, reducing the cost of education through free learning materials. That's pretty straightforward and makes sense, so I'll check that box. Uh, next, providing a discount on the price of traditional publisher textbooks. That's not really, that's sort of a, a short step that's not really going the whole way, so I don't think that's one of the motivators. Um, Third option, saving instructors prep time for their courses. I'll be totally upfront and let you know that working with OER, if you're going to be adapting it, actually will not save you time, at least in the, in the, uh, from the start. Um, it may require some more time and more deep involvement with the content. So it's not gonna save instructors time. That's not one of our primary goals. Uh, but lastly, uh, giving faculty full control of the content to innovate with it, that is uh, the next one. So the two are reduced costs of uh, education materials and also to uh, facilitate this innovation by giving faculty full control. And we'll do the knowledge check and gold stars, awesome. There also is a link at the bottom. Um, US PERG is US Publish Public Interest Research Group um, and they put out a publication a few years ago called Covering the Cost. Um, there's a link there and that sort of goes into more detail about the uh, the cost of textbooks and how students are dealing with it um, and sort of the opportunity available to us once open textbooks and OER are more available. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to ask Sarah um, if, if she's able to check the chat and see if there are any questions that have popped up that, that might uh, touch back on these first two sections. We've had a few come in. Um, just taking a look here. Um, a few good ones came in actually. 
One folk, some of the people asked about if you could clarify the difference between fair use and OER. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, if you're interested in, in the difference between fair use and OER, I would encourage you to actually look in the next chapter where we dive more deeply into copyright and OER. Um, but just to give you kind of a, a quick answer, um, so OER um, come with an open license that explicitly tells you how you can use a resource, um, whereas fair use is not a set of permissions. Fair use um, is, is sort of a way where um, your own particular use might be judged. If anyone thought that you might be um, sort of using their content in a way that they didn't, uh, if they didn't put an open license on the content, um, but you thought that your own use was fair, it's more of a defense. It's not permissions, it's a defense saying, um, you know, if you look up the Wikipedia page for fair use, there are several criteria that, you, that would need to be used to judge if your particular use falls under fair use. Um, but again, that's a defense, um, but that's not forward thinking permissions. Thank you for the clarification. We do have some other questions coming in. Um, we'll probably sure. save those a little bit more toward the end when we can go through and kind of rehash everything. Okay, absolutely. Great. So I will move on to the next section. So uh, next we get to open licenses and OER. And so at the end of this next small segment, um, uh, I'm hoping that you all will be able to describe the importance of open copyright license for OER. Again, the open license, the, the legal permissions associated with OER are key. They, they are sort of I've heard them described as the linchpin of OER. Without uh, legal permissions, without an open license, um, OER aren't actually much different. Um, and so let's let's dive into that. Um, so let's see. Um, the CC licenses they were created to make it easy for anyone to grant copyright permissions broadly um, for others to use without having to ask each time. Um, the largest, sort of the, the first big initiative of this, it was um, out of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, and it was the MIT Open Courseware, OCW initiative, and you can look that up, um, MIT OCW, and that was where MIT, um, through a grant from the Hewlett Foundation, decided um, that they were going to publicly share out um, lots of their courseware. And I believe this is back in 2002 or 2003, um, where they shared out thousands of courses. And they decided that it was more important to be sharing out um, the knowledge they had created um, than to keep everything all rights reserved. And what it ended up doing was actually um, giving folks all around the world who might be considering attending MIT sort of a taste of what they would be encountering um, once they got there. And it allowed um, sort of broad reuse of MIT's courseware. And this is the kind of case um, when you consider that OER, they're considered in economic terms to be non-rivalrous materials, meaning I can take my materials and give you a copy of them, and it doesn't actually take away from the materials I still have, I, I keep them. And so MIT openly shared out um, thousands of courses, I believe it was seven or 8,000 courses um, through the MIT Open Courseware Initiative um, to, to sort of like uh, to flatten access to everything and to, to showcase um, the expertise of their faculty and instructors. Um, so getting back to the licenses, um, every CC license has one underlying uh, piece to it. The foundational aspect is, um, is attribution. And what attribution is really is just giving credit to the person who shared their work with you. And so when you take an existing OER that has a CC license on it um, and you reuse it in your own context for your own purposes, the fundamental piece of all the licenses, and there are six, uh, the fundamental piece is that you have to give credit, like a small mention at the bottom, um, this work was originally published by this person. And we'll get into more detail in just a moment. But attribution is the fundamental piece of every part of it. Um, because the idea is that creators, what all creators want really is to get credit for their work. And so attribution is an underlying piece of all the licenses. Um, but then there are other conditions that can be combined into the six licenses. And there are three conditions that sort of work alongside each other or in concert with each other to produce the licenses depending on how you would like 
work to be shared. And this is important to understand um, so that when you do find OER, you know what you can do with it. So the three conditions of the various licenses are, one is called share alike, and you'll see it as SA, and that means that all derivative works must be shared with the same license. So if you find a CC by SA, so the SA license uh, means that if you take it and you modify it and you share it back out, then as you share it, it has to have the same license attached to it. Uh, the second piece um, is non-commercial, uh, that's NC. And so uh, that means that commercial rights are reserved by the author, by the creator. Um, and so your use cannot be a commercial use. Um, if you do intend to make commercial use of uh, an OER that's licensed with an NC license, you do need to contact uh, the, the creator for permission first. And lastly, um, the no derivatives ND clause, um, a condition. That means that the work can be shared and held onto, but only if it remains unchanged. So if you find um, OER that has a license with ND built into it, um, then you cannot make changes to it if you intend to share it out. So again, um, all the licenses have the foundational aspect, which is attribution, giving credit. Um, but then there are three conditions that can be combined share alike, meaning that as you share the work, it has to have the same license attached, non-commercial, which means that folks cannot make commercial use of it, and third, no derivatives, meaning that the work um, can be shared, but it has to be shared in an unchanged way. And I will say, uh, there's a note down here, um, that the ND licenses that were created by Creative Commons um, are not considered to be OER licenses um, because they don't allow customers customization and modification, which really sit at the core of how OER are intended to be reused. So I'm going to scroll down. Um, the way you can think about OER um, is through, um, it's called the 5R activities. If any of you have heard of David Wiley, he was one of the sort of thought leaders early on in the OER movement. Um, and so he characterize OER as your ability to do certain things. And so uh, first one is R for retain. So you can retain, you can own and control a copy of the content, you can hold on to it forever. Uh, reuse, you can reuse the content in a wide range of, way, of ways. Uh, revise the content, so adapting it, adjusting it, or modifying it. Uh, remixing it, which means to combine more than one existing material or OER. Um, and lastly, to redistribute or share out your, your changes, um, your work. And so uh, when I sort of reach back to the human nutrition OER textbook that I mentioned earlier, um, we exercised all of these permissions and these permissions were, were made possible through the open license. Um, when you look at all rights reserved content, you would not be able to do these things. Um, and when we look at um, sort of the textbook rental situation, the dynamic that's forming right now. Um, we have students renting textbooks um, from major publishers, um, but it's limited access. And so at the end of a 16 week course, um, the, the course material and access for the students just disappears. And so automatically we can just see uh, that the students are not able to retain it, much less reuse, revise, remix, or redistribute any of that content. So. Um, let's move on um, and we'll stop after this and I'll, I'll kind of give everyone a moment to, to ask questions. Uh, lastly, the CC licenses were designed in a way um, so that they are interoperable, so that licenses or so that OER that may have different licenses on them can be remixed in a meaningful way and they're not blocked um, sort of by having different licenses. And you can think about interoperability in terms of um, sort of, even if, if the CC licenses did not exist and everybody had to hire a lawyer to write um, a copyright license that would give others permission to use the work, um, the chances that every lawyer would write the license in a way that was interoperable with the other thousands or millions of lawyers writing those licenses is pretty much close to none. Um, and so uh, CC licenses were created and have been adopted widely as sort of the gold standard so that um, all the millions of OER that are licensed with, with CC licenses, they can be, they are interoperable and they can work together. 
So we'll go down to the knowledge check. Um, which of the four are, which of the, which four of the following are key reasons why open licenses are important for OER? This is a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a trick. So let's, uh, let's all tune in. Uh, first one, open licenses guarantee a monetary return on all content shared with them. Um, that is not a part of, uh, that is not a part of the licenses. The licenses do not guarantee that you're going to get money uh, back, but that's also uh, not usually why folks are sharing their content out. Um, let's see the next one. Uh, CC licenses make it easy to share with different permissions. That's absolutely true. Again, there are different conditions that can be combined to, to uh, be different licenses, uh, depending on how you'd like to share the resources. Uh, next one, Creative Commons licenses are interoperable. They work together um, so, that we can re so that we can remix OER with different licenses. Absolutely, that's a big piece of it. Check that box. Um, third, or fourth rather, open licenses make it clear how others can use your work. This is essential, this is so key, um, again, because uh, individuals that want to use an OER do not have to ask every time because when you put an open license on the work or when you find work that is under an open license, it's very clear how that work can be reused. So I'll check that box. Um, the, the second to last one, open licenses let us keep permissions that copyright automatically gives away. Um, that's actually uh, not true. Uh, that's not one we're going to select. Um, copyright automatically in, in many places actually reserves all rights. Nothing's given away automatically. Um, and the licenses don't, don't play in that domain. Um, so the last one, all the licenses include a requirement for attribution or giving credit to the creator. That is key. Um, again, what creators want is to be given credit for their work. So I will check that. It's a little bit unfair because I've already gone through these a number of times but I do get a gold star, which is exciting. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about open, open content OER and how it's defined by David Wiley, you can click uh, on that link down at the bottom. I'm gonna go back up and see what the next section is. Um, this is sort of the, the last piece. Um, and this is, I'm hoping that this will uh, give all of you an idea of where to begin looking for OER and how you might incorporate OER into your own instruction. Um, so we'll just jump in, uh, knowing what to look for. Um, OER really are any kind of learning and teaching and research resources that have an open license on them, on them so that they are free of cost and that they, they have, uh, you're granted uh, permissions through copyright to use them. And there are a couple of different kinds of repositories. Um, here at the University of Hawaii, we have our own local repository. Um, and these links are all active, you can click them. Uh, where we store copies of OER that we have already reused or that we've published. Um, and many institutions of higher education and many institutions, um, you know, school districts and even at the state level, there are repositories where OER are stored so everybody can access them. Uh, SUNY from the New York State University system, they have a, an extensive OER repository with lots of good content in there. And again, we have MIT's open coursework. Those are just a few examples, but there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of OER repositories where you might find useful resources. Um, other repositories, this is a very uh, well-known one um, called OER Commons, and that's a place that's all um, OER resources. It's very well organized um, by grade level and by uh, subject and by um, even by um, standards. So if you're teaching to specific standards, um, many of them are tagged in that way. Um, Wikimedia Commons, uh, the second one in that list, um, it's a widely popular um, uh, repository for contents. Um, uh, basically, all of the images that you might find on a Wikipedia page and many more will be in Wikimedia Commons. So I'd advise you to check there if you're looking for sort of individual pieces. Um, and then lastly, the Internet Archive um, is a great place to look for OER. They have lots of uh, content, educational content and otherwise that um, is either in the public domain um, or has an open license on it. Um, and the last piece uh, in terms of where you might find content uh, locations, um, are, it's called a referatory and a referatory um, that is a, a platform that doesn't necessarily store the content themselves, but they might store 
reviews or information about the content and link out to them. So the Open Textbook Library from the University of Minnesota, um, that's a great place if you teach in higher education and you need something that's a nice container like a, an open textbook, you can go there and you can find faculty reviews of the existing resources they have there. Uh, Merlot, um, and that is a referatory that's part of the, uh, the California State University system. Um, thousands and thousands, I'm not sure if they're in the millions yet, but thousands and thousands of resources um, with reviews and comments um, by instructors can be found there. Um, and also the learning registry is another place that you might check. And so those, um, we're gonna have lots of locations, websites um, where you might go to to find resources. Um, but if finding resources um, at those specific locations might not work for you, um, Google um, through advanced search um, does allow you to sort uh, search by license. And so if you know um, sort of how to decode um, the descriptors that Google uses to distinguish the licenses, and I have a little guide right here to show you, um, you can sort by license. So um, you'll have to go to the advanced search and down under usage rights, you'll see the drop down menu um, and all of these pick up um, online OER that have been tagged with CC licenses. And they index all that and make it pretty easy to sort of uh, find resources that might be useful to you. Uh, the last thing, um, and this has sort of changed since I wrote this book. I published this book, um, the OER training manual last year. Um, CC search has changed um, and they have, I'm gonna click on the button and go to search.creativecommons.org. Um, they have an image search. Um, that's their primary focus right now. Um, but I will say um, that they do have the old CC search portal available. So in the upper right hand corner, um, you can click to go here. And basically they have a set of uh, repositories that you can search all at once. You enter a search query and specify uh, which licenses you might want to search the content under um, and it will return results for you. Um, that said, um, I did um, and, you know, obviously uh, many of you, most of you are focused on, on language learning resources. And so um, out of the, um, the University of Texas, they have a Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. And this is probably a great starting point for many of you. Um, and the URL is up here and I can, I can share the link out later. Maybe someone can drop it into the chat. Um, essentially, uh, this is a center focused on OER and language learning specifically. Um, it's one of only a few that I'm aware of. This is probably the best place to start. Um, you can search, let's see, if you go to the top tab, one of them is materials. You can scroll down and you can search by specific languages. And so they've done a good job of by hand indexing all OER that support various language learning. Um, you may find uh, language that you are, are teaching in your instruction um, in, in this list. Um, if not, then it may be a reason for you to work on your own resources and share them out so that others might reuse them. Um, I also did want to turn your attention to our own OER website. If you're interested, um, it's oer.hawaii.edu and we have um, links to resources. If you go to find OER and just click on, on the main button, then I have handpicked a number of resources here. Again, this is focused on higher education because those are the folks that I work with. Um, but in this list, there are lots of folks, um, lots of repositories and referatories um, that, that support our own adoption of OER and that we, when we publish OER, we share them out to these resources that are, or they're automatically picked up um, by these groups. Um, quickly, I have a, a link here also um, this is our local repository. And so if your institution does have um, a repository where research or education materials are shared, um, you can do like we've done and that's sort of carve out a section of it just for OER, um, which is sort of unique. And, and everyone knows that all the resources they find in our OER repository, not only are they freely available at no cost, but every item in here um, has an open license on them. And so just to give you an example, this is a project um, that we funded uh, through our Outreach College grants. Um, it's a Japanese language instruction. 
um, and they titled it, uh, it's two parts, two volumes, um, titled Musubi, A New Approach to Japanese Language and Culture. And so if you click into our repository, you can get PDFs with an open license of these materials. Let me see if I can open it quickly. It just downloaded it. Let's see. Just a moment, bear with me. So this is OER created at the University of Hawaii um, by Japanese language instructors. And here is the open license. So um, as an example, when you are looking for materials to use in your own instruction and you come across OER that has an, that has an open license on it, um, you need to know, you know what you can do with it. And so this CC license is CC BY. BY is the attribution, so you have to give credit. Um, NC, so you can't make commercial use of this work and ND, so you can't change it. So this is sort of uh, one of the less open licenses, but again, um, with this open license, um, anyone who comes and visits this resource um, can download it and use it in their instruction, um, and it just needs to be unmodified and unchanged unless you reach out to the authors, which are listed here, um, and you can get their email addresses uh, from UH. Um, and even this is an opportunity to collaborate with them and say, you know, uh, we're doing something interesting and we'd like to incorporate your work. Um, can we have permission? Um, and if so, um, then that might be a really interesting collaboration. Um, uh, last thing I will point out, um, uh, UNESCO and the UN, they do take OER seriously um, and they've been a huge champion of OER all around the world. Um, they have an interesting website here um, on unesco.org. Um, where you can find out information about sort of the history of OER, how they've been involved, um, statements and resolutions that they've passed, um, and various reports and publications that, that they've put out um, demonstrating the potential of OER and the, the impact that we've already experienced because of it. Um, I will jump back to our handbook. And uh, there is no uh, knowledge check at the bottom of this, um, but there is um, a link to one more resource if you'd like to take a look. Um, and it basically just shows sort of um, what's possible with OER. So I will scroll back up. Um, again, uh, this book is available to everybody for free at no cost with an open license on it. Um, and this is what I use for my own workshops and instructions here at the University of Hawaii. If you'd like to take a copy of it, please do. Um, this button right here shows a dropdown. Um, we use a platform called Pressbooks to publish our OER, which makes it so we author and edit our content all in one place. And then it's able to be exported into a range of formats for um, digital PDF uh, viewing. If you'd like to print it, you're able to or Mobi, or if you're more on the techie side, there's XML that you can use to um, put it in your own Pressbooks instance or another platform that understands how to use XML. So um, it's, it's quite a lot. Uh, it's, it's about 1045. And so I'm going to hand the mic back to Sarah. Um, hopefully we can have a short discussion and sort of uh, we can answer some questions that might've come up in the chat. Thank you, Billy. That was fantastic. And as a Japanese instructor, I want to thank you for introducing me to Musubi. That looks fantastic as well. And I look forward to digging in there after everything's all done tonight. So I know what I'll be doing for bedtime reading this evening. So awesome. thank you for that. So we had a lot of great questions come up. We always do because these webinars always attract the best educators. And one in particular that came up that I wanted to ask about um, was related to our um, resources um, that would be open, for example, for auto grading. So with a lot of the textbooks, even the ones that are rented, usually you can assign some auto graded activities to students just for some basic exercises. And sometimes that might not be present in an OER type of a situation. Are there any OER alternatives for activities like those? Um, yeah, so we use a tool um, called H5P. Um, and you can go to h5p.org, um, and that is sort of embeddable assessment items. And that's what I use for the knowledge checks at the bottom um, of each of my lessons in that OER handbook. Um, we have H5P assessments that are auto-graded. There's actually lots of behaviors you can um, sort of uh, 
uh, build into the assessments where students either have a second or third chance to answer or do not. Um, there's drag and drop, multiple choice, image maps, all kinds of things that are automatically created and reported uh, through H5P. Um, if you are teaching in a different domain um, for math and for physics and for various other platforms um, or, or sorry, subject areas, there are tools that are, are maturing and becoming available. Um, but as far as interaction and auto grading, um, that's an area where folks are actively working to sort of um, improve what's offered. Definitely, and it's important, especially for students in world languages to get that real-time feedback. So any tools like that would be really helpful. Thank you, yeah, appreciate yeah, that. Sure. Um, some other questions that came in, what's your advice on quality issues concerning OERs? Because some things like Musubi, for example, looks fantastic. Maybe some other things maybe need a little bit of work. What advice can you give for seeking out quality materials? Sure, sure. Um, and so vetting materials is really important. Um, obviously, you don't want to, just like any um, textbook or curriculum, you want to read through and sort of uh, verify that what's in it is actually how you want the instruction to go in your courses. Um, here at UH, uh, through our grant program, as we're publishing, um, we have each of the faculty who is an author or an editor on the book also um, bring in um, a faculty reviewer from the department um, and outside reviewers to review the content before it's published. And the review of the content falls into two categories, uh, or two buckets. Uh, one category is for copy editing, and these kinds of people don't necessarily need to be subject matter experts, but they do need to be experts in terms of um, understanding uh, the flow of content, flow and tone and structure. Um, the second group is subject matter experts, those that can verify that the information is accurate, um, you know, add credibility to it or lend credibil credibility to it um, and sort of verify um, that it is what you want to be showing um, in the instruction. Um, the, the vetting and the verification and the quality control really comes down to the individual group that's publishing the resources. Um, and so that's sort of a, a step that we build in. Um, finding reviewers can be a little bit tricky, but there are groups like the Rebus Foundation and the Open Textbook Network that can help uh, find volunteer reviewers uh, to help get that job done. Excellent. I'm uh, sorry, jumping back to our last question, looks like Stephen wanted to jump in or a question related to um, the online sort of the real time assessments. Uh, Stephen, if you wanted to jump in on that, I apologize, I missed your chat before. Hi, yes, I'm on the staff of the NFLRC, so I'm uh, assuming special privileges here jumping in. Uh, I just wanted to do a conceptual clarification for everybody. I'm sure that many of the teachers listening in are interested in making use of open educational resources, but conceptually sometimes it's a little difficult to understand how an H5P resource might be taken into your learning management system and then attached to the learning management system so that the students can do those exercises and get those points returned to the teacher while still maintaining the privacy and integrity of their information. If there's an H5P resource in the wild, like on the web somewhere, you can do the exercises in it just like we were doing just now with uh, your open your OER textbook, but those scores that we see are simply visible to us in that moment. They're not going to some teacher somewhere. And so in order to make use of a resource like that and have the grades captured from the student and given to the teacher, it would be necessary for the H5P resource to be imported, placed into a learning, learning management system like Moodle and that would uh, keep the student you know, privacy intact because we can't have student scores being openly visible. Um, have you had any experience with uh, situations like that where you had to place an H5P resource into a learning management system? Can you talk about that a little, Billy? Sure, sure. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so the, the two ways that we're managing um, sort of assessment right now with OER, um, one of them is with H5P inside of Pressbooks. And Pressbooks is the platform that we use to publish um, the handbook that, that everyone was taking a look at. Um, and we have authentication working on our Pressbooks. So students actually log into the Pressbook using their University of Hawaii username. Um, and they 
um, and their scores in the H5P objects are all kept within the book. So they're very secure. Um, and so outside of the book, um, inside the learning management system, we use Sakai, it's a flavor of Sakai called Dalima. Um, we encourage folks to, to use the, um, the quiz and assessment tools built into there, um, which are automatically connected to the gradebook. And there are some pretty advanced features that you're able to, um, to use inside those, inside Laolin or Sakai or Moodle or Canvas or whatever you may be using that do have auto grading and sort of uh, more powerful tools in there. Um, but our OER, we're, we're trying to, to work with HIP and Freshbooks as a standalone system. Um, and we're looking at ways to sort of uh, more easily or more usefully reveal what the student scores are to the instructor. Um, so the instructor knows sort of how students are doing when they walk into the lecture, um, but also for students and self-regulation. So students know sort of um, where they are sort of having uh, difficulty and which areas they're just kind of flying through and, and finding a lot of success. So it's an area, you know, beyond just uh, sort of textbook, uh, typical flat content um, that everyone is working on. Um, and we're just going to kind of see where things go. Excellent, thank you for that. And can you share any personal experience with substituting OER completely for traditional textbooks? And do you feel that online learning is more suited for that than traditional courses? Um, yeah, so it really depends on the teaching style of the instructor and the, the size of the student group that they're working with. Um, we've had a couple different adoptions in microeconomics and macroeconomics and in physics and in math courses um, where there are hundreds of students um, where the instructor, even before I began working with them, had found OpenStax. And OpenStax is out of Rice University. Um, and basically, um, just as an instructor might choose a typical textbook from uh, Pearson or Sangrage or, or McGraw-Hill, off the shelf and just use it in instruction, um, they can do that with OpenStax and that, that's already what's happened. Uh, now, when it comes to OER being more ideal for online learning, um, you know, I'm not sure if it makes that much of a difference. Um, it, it really works, works well in online or face-to-face -face or hybrid settings. Um, it really depends on how the instructor intends to use the synchronous time or if there is synchronous time. Um, and so, um, you know, I would say that with once the content is open, the instructor has a lot more flexibility about how they use the content and they can grab things and put them into lecture slides. They can assign only pieces of them. They can eliminate pieces they might not get to. A lot of times um, in all textbooks, um, when the instructors get to the end of the course, chapters 16, 17, and 18 are not the ones they end up using. Um, that's totally fine. Um, but if, you know, with the proprietary, a paid book, um, students still have to pay for the complete book, even if not all the content is used. So yeah, I think OER, it does, it does favor instructors who are more techie and willing to kind of engage more deeply with the material. Um, but for delivery mode, online, face-to-face uh, -face or, or hybrid, I think OER uh, works great. Definitely, it's also nice to have that level of flexibility for sure. Um, and if you happen to be browsing and as a creator, if you've noticed that your work, some of your work that you created was used without attribution, uh, attribution rather, what can you do about that as a creator? Sure, um, the, the most straightforward way to deal with that, which is actually really uncommon, um, is to, to reach out to the person, person publishing the website and sort of um, ask them or, or say, this looks like something that I created and I put an open license on it, but I'm not getting credit for it. Um, can you please credit me on it? Um, again, it's such a rare instance um, that I actually haven't encountered it myself. Um, uh, and I actually haven't encountered it with instructors that I've worked with that have put OER out there. It's, it's fairly rare, um, but really um, uh, giving credit um, is really important, not only for the creator to be credited and sort of um, be, you know, uh, get kudos for what they put out there, but also for the person reusing the content. Um, if they're not the ones who, who built the content, um, they're going to want to point back to the source where they got it from, and that the source where they got it from, oftentimes, that's going to lead credibility to the person reusing it. So it, it usually uh, behooves the person reusing content to point back to where they got it from. Definitely, definitely, and it's easier now we have Creative Commons and 
the set framework that we can use to give the proper attributions for sure. Definitely. Can you speak to any privacy issues or concerns with using student contributions, for example, that might be used in an OER? Oh, absolutely. So student contributions in OER, um, that needs to be handled with care. Um, students, um, you know, a lot of times students are already sort of helping helping update or, or fix or, or uh, sort of uh, maintain books and material or curriculum. Um, and so it needs to be something where students are always given the opportunity to not have their name put on anything that might be put out there. Um, there are, there are uh, actually open textbooks or guides about publishing open textbooks with students that talk through all the, you know, the issues related to that. Um, but you need to start from a place where students uh, who may be contributing to a book or to the curriculum, um, they, uh, you need to start from a place where their, their names and identifying information are never put out there unless it's appropriate and permission is given by the students to do that. Definitely important. And as an online teacher, I can certainly vouch that that student teacher relationship is so important and you can't break that trust. So that's an important point to bring up. So thank you uh, for that. Much appreciated. Um, I can tell you just from my personal thoughts, um, sometimes, especially as an online teacher, we can get a little bit nervous about branching out and trying some of these new resources. But now that we have this background and this presentation, and especially being able to download everything and putting it into a PDF format just so I can hang on to it in case I ever want to use that in the future. That's super helpful. So Billy, we really appreciate you coming out to talk with us today. And again, Thank you for everything that you put together for us. And again, appreciate your time. Yeah, awesome. No, thanks for having me. It's, it's been great to um, share all these things with everybody and to have um, sort of the, everything that I've sort of poured into one book useful to many more people. That's sort of a reward in itself. So thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Again, thank you for coming out.